welcome to the session of ACS Science Talks, Connecting the World Through Science. This is the virtual lecture series, Scientific Talks by Specialists on Specialized Topics for a Specialized Audience. I'm Kunal Gupta, and I'm pleased to be your host for today's broadcast of ACS Science Talks. Now, our speaker for today is Dr. Jessica Schiffman. Dr. Schiffman is a full professor of chemical engineering and the Gary R. Lapidus Professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She received her BS uh, from, in material science and engineering from Rutgers University and went on to do her master's in engineering in material science from Cornell and then a PhD in material science and engineering from Drexel University. After pursuing her postdoctoral associate in environmental engineering at Yale University. Currently, Dr. Schiffman directs an interdisciplinary and imaginative research group that invents, that invents polymer-based materials that address grand challenges in human health, the environment, and industry by combining concepts and tools from chemical engineering, nanotechnology, and microbiology. Among many other honors, Dr. Schiffman was named an influential researcher by industrial and engineering chemistry research and was awarded the American Chemical Society Applied Materials and Interfaces Young Investigator Award. She is the inaugural deputy editor of the peer-reviewed journal ACS Applied Engineering Materials. In recognition of her dedication to mentoring and teaching, Dr. Schiffman was awarded the University of Massachusetts campus-wide Distinguished Graduate Mentor Award and the Advanced Faculty Mentor Award, as well as the College of Engineering's Outstanding Teaching Award. Dr. Shipman served as the interim department head of the Department of Chemical Engineering from 2021-2022, and prior to that, as the associate department head. Thank you, Dr. Shipman, for joining us. The stage is all yours. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the warm welcome in the chat. It is so fantastic to see where everyone is from. And I, I always love a, love a live chat box. So um, yes, I am a professor of chemical engineering at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. By training, I'm a material scientist. And in my lab, we do a lot of microbiology. So I'll get into more about how these very interdisciplinary groups come together. Um, so first, I'm going to tell you through our research a lot about how bacteria and materials interact. And then I'm going to tell you about the new journal, ACS Applied Engineering Materials. So first of all, you all told me where you're from, but greetings from Amherst, Massachusetts. So here we are. I'm in the Northeast region of the United States. We're about uh, two hours from Boston, two hours north of New York. Um, and you can see that my lab, we have a great group, a great interdisciplinary group of scientists. Sometimes we're in the lab, sometimes we just arrange on staircases to take pictures. Um, and overall our campus, especially right now in the spring, actually first day of summer is very green. We have rolling hills in the background. And this is actually the building that we conduct most of our science in. It's a very, a modern, beautiful building. Our lab is up here. We have shared characterization on the side. And so this is really a fun place for us to do our research. And so first of all, we're engineers. We always want to improve many different applications. We're a little application agnostic. If we can make materials that help worldly problems, then that's what we want to do. So let me tell you about some of the problems that we work on. Um, these are all just, you know, generic stock images so we can use our imagination a little bit more. Uh, bacteria cause a lot of problems in the medical field. And so for that reason, we work on making a number of different wound dressings, hydrogel bandages in order to decrease microbial infections. We can think about in membranes, water treatment, we work in this area a lot too. We really want to have the clean water. Membranes work fantastically, but over time they get fouled. We care about biological fouling. To prevent membrane fouling, we want to make a membrane that self cleans so we don't have to use extra energy to push that clean water through the membranes. We also work in the area of industrial coatings. These could also be coatings in the medical center, such as a hospital coating, um, something like that where we really want to make an anti-fouling coating. We can imagine on the side of ships or something like that, 
We want to reduce drag so we don't use more fuel to make things more fuel efficient. Okay, in our bottom row, well, we all have some very smelly laundry. Uh, what we want to do here is we can make textiles, clothing wearable that bacteria and proteins don't stick to. The smell that generates off of our gym clothing is actually from those proteins. And so if we can keep these clothing cleaner, we can maybe use less laundry detergent. Um, okay, this is a, we'll talk more about textiles today. Um, and then in terms of crop protection, we really want to, you know, increase food availability and improve agriculture. So in this case, we might actually want to be delivering live enzymes, or we might want to protect the crops from uh, different contaminants. And then finally, I just want to introduce the concept of not all bacteria are bad, right? And so in some cases, we're actually trying to keep our bacteria alive and deliver the healthy biofilms into the gut microbiome. So these are some of the general applications that we're interested in. And in all of them, there's bacteria present. And so our focus is on how the bacteria attach to surfaces and how we can control that interface. This is a very classic image of how a biofilm develops. We have these individual bacteria, they colonize on any surface, like all those that I just showed. And then over time, they're going to excrete this extracellular polymer matrix. That's this brown goo. Once you have this gooey gel around the bacteria, the biofilms and the bacteria get harder to treat. We have a diffusion limitation, right? It's harder for antibiotics to diffuse into the bacteria. And the bacteria talk to each other. They communicate and they become harder to fight. And also over time, the bacteria actually uh, throw out little parts of biofilms to go colonize on a different part of the surface, which starts a new biofilm. So again, it's harder to diffuse in the antimicrobials, and the bacteria grow resistant to them. In terms of antibiotics, I'm sure many of you have heard about the rise of antibiotic resistance. What this table is showing, and we can go ahead and kind of match the colors to each other, is it shows the date that a, back, that a antibiotic was discovered. So in 1928, penicillin was discovered. And then, like I said, if we match the color up here, we can see the date that bacteria started showing resistance to that antibiotic, and that was 1940. And so we can see every commercial antibiotic that has been discovered, bacteria have shown resistance to it. That means we have to use more of that antibiotic to kill the bacteria. And remember, I talked about that diffusion limit. So we also have to use more on top of that because it's really hard for those antibiotics to get to those bacteria and kill them. Okay, some other concerns we have about commercial antibiotics include their release rate, how long it takes to deplete that agent we have en encapsulated, toxicity to human cells, and of course, this bacterial resistance. Okay, so with this brief overview, now I'm going to tell you really what the topic of this talk will be about. Today, I'm going to guide you to uh, how we can make antibacterial surfaces or surfaces that kill bacteria and activate them, and then move into how we can make a surface anti-fouling, which we kind of think about as being slippery or repellent to bacteria. And in this overview of these topics, how we make antibacterial killing surfaces or anti-fouling bacteria resistant surfaces, I'm gonna guide you through the publications that my lab has personally conducted. So it's a little bit of a, my own perspective of how we have contributed to these two fields. Okay. So as you might imagine, the most classic way to make an antibacterial surface is to have a polymer or a metal or any kind of coating that releases a commercial antibiotic. And so this is a very classic way. Typically the antimicrobial or 
you know, the antibiotic has to diffuse out of the coating and then it has to get to the bacteria and transport into their membrane. We're not gonna go into details about microbiology or biology today. We're gonna stick to the materials end, but you know, maybe that's a topic of a future talk. And so for these relief coatings, we really have to get into that bacteria inside them. Another classic way that we can make a material that kills bacteria is actually to have cationic charges on the surface of a material. Uh, very famously, these cationic charges could be from quaternary amines or uh, uh, peptides that we synthesize. And here, we call this a contact killing because the bacteria have to literally come into contact with those cationic charges to interact with their membrane. So like I said, I wanna guide you through our work. I've already said that commercial antibiotics you know, we need some alternatives, right? And so when I started my group at UMass Amherst in about 2011, we thought, what is greener? What is bio-inspired? What's greener than commercial antibiotics? And we thought, okay, how about instead of commercial antibiotics, we look to nature and use a number of different essential oils. In this particular example, we use cinnamaldehyde extracted from cinnamon, and this is our release agent. And we attached it and released it from chitazan. Chitazan, derived from chitin, a waste product of the seafood industry, has an abundance of amine groups on its backbone. Let's look at this in a little bit more detail. Uh, but first, we decided to make this into a wound dressing as one of our, one of our key applications. And so in order to do that, my lab does a lot of electro spinning. So here's just a, a basic setup. And honestly, you know, my students will laugh because our whole electro spinning unit has cardboard boxes to insulate and is housed in a glass case to control the environment. So it's something we really build and can manipulate all the parameters ourselves. Uh, very simply, we have our polymer solution that's held at a fixed distance from a metallic collector plate. And we can push that polymer solution forward and it'll make a spherical droplet. When we apply the voltage difference between that spherical droplet and our collector plate, that spherical droplet starts to undergo bending instabilities and it starts to whip. As it's whipping, it's going to thin, the solvent's going to evaporate, and it's going to attach to the collector as this non-woven, these beautiful tiny fibers. This is our uh, scanning electron microscope image of our fibers. And here's a macro scale image of these fibers. It's kind of like a very soft uh, tissue or something like that. They have many nice properties, high surface area, high levels of porosity, and we can electrospin from many different polymers and we can also functionalize them after we make them. What I've always thought is really cool about electrospinning, even though in the lab we have a very modular system, it can also be scaled down. Uh, this is ideal for, let's say, a patient that under, underwent was a burn victim, something like that. We can put down new skin, or there's a number of companies that scale up electrospinning and can make these sheets of this very functional fibers. Okay, so we're going to use electrospinning as our platform here to make our nanofiber mats. And as I said, we want to go green in order to make these antimicrobial materials that kill bacteria. So we took chitazan, here our structure is shown. We have lots of amine groups. Uh, I think our, our chitazan is about 85% deacetylated. And chitazan has many intrinsic properties from that amine group. It's antibacterial and it holds on to metal ions. Uh, you know, that's what the chelate means. It can hold on and help for remediation, such as water remediation. We also took advantage of this amine group to do a shift based reaction to attach some cinnamaldehyde to the, back, to the backbone, as shown here. And actually, it was pH reversible. So when we were in a wound setting at an acidic condition, we actually released that cinnamaldehyde. Cinnamaldehyde is so interesting. It has actually a quorum sensing inhibitor. That means that for Pseudomonas, for example, 
it actually prevents the bacteria from talking to each other. This is great. And we say low bacteria resistance, but I don't think bacteria have shown resistance to the naturally made cinnamaldehyde. Okay, so we have some cinnamon on the backbone and some that's just incorporated. And just one figure. So here, what I am showing you is how many bacteria, how many Pseudomonas aeruginosa die as a percent, as a function of incubation time. And so as you can see, um, here we have a blank control, meaning nothing's there. And then these middle bars are showing chitosan alone in white. So even chitosan alone kills about 50% of the Pseudomonas. However, when we increase the amount of these colorful bars, increase the amount of cinnamaldehyde, we actually have an increased amount of killing of the Pseudomonas. And after 180 minutes, actually maybe even after 90 minutes, we have the same amount of killing as if we had this a volatile essential oil just by itself in solution with the bacteria. So this is incredibly effective. I also want to know, I'm not even showing you the data for killing E. coli K12 because we didn't even need phenomaldehyde. The chitosan itself killed all of these bacteria. Okay, great. So that's our example of some of our early work to say, let's use something greener than commercial antibiotics to make this release coding. I didn't mention that after that cinnamaldehyde came off, it would retain its amine groups. And so this material still had that function. If the bacteria touched those amine groups, it would be cationic. Okay. Another way we can make an antibacterial surface by contact killing is to use topography. So here's a cartoon, and actually here's a, you know, a table of contents graphic from one of our manuscripts uh, that kind of shows this very well also, of where certain topography has been shown that once bacteria comes into contact with that bacteria, um, or once the bacteria comes into contact with that bed of nails, the bacteria actually becomes inactivated. The bacteria tries to crawl away and instead it self impinges itself. When we talk about bacteria resistance, I can only imagine that bacteria would literally have to grow a much thicker skin in order to survive this kind of topography. And so in this one example, this collaboration, uh, we tried to mimic, we were inspired by nature, we tried to mimic the backs of the geckos that have these long hairs and they actually have these sharp corners. In this case, we grew these inorganic materials. And again, the bacteria, uh, in this case, Pseudomonas, was much more effective at being killed by this structure because it would crawl across it. When we actually use this structure against a different bacteria like MRSA, which is spherical, like a grape, we actually did not have as much inactivation. So this leads me to a question of, well, some topography can kill bacteria. Not all topography kills bacteria, right? So what happens if I change that topography? We looked into this in 2020 um, in this study where we use nano imprint lithography to make these two different structures. Now, the structures are quite similar. We have these close packed pillar arrays. The end material is made out of siloxane. It's PDMS. So PDMS by itself, that chemistry doesn't kill. And what we show here is this P1100 means that our pitch or our center to center distance between two different pillars is about 1,100 nanometers or about one micron. In this P480, we have a smaller pitch. So this means that our pillars are closer together. We thought that these uh, pitch distance is the characteristic length scale. And that's what we have plotted over here. This is a, a heat map or just a summary of the data that we saw. And so since we started off talking about antibacterial, we can look here and see that our E. coli, which are rod shaped about one and a half microns by a half a micron, well, 
they too die by our smaller pillars. However, when we look at some of our smaller structures, they do not kill as well. And actually, when we conducted two different assays, one which we looked at killing and one that we looked at anti-fouling or repelling, we actually saw that the same kind of structure could both kill or repel the E. coli. So this might be interesting. We can repel lots of bacteria, lots of E. coli, and the ones that do stick around get killed. Okay. But what we also see is when we look at the larger pillars that are about the same size as the E. coli, they don't kill them. Maybe the bacteria are starting to fall within that spacing of the pillar. And these are all for the E. coli. Okay. Down below, I'm showing this MRSA, this Staph aureus. This causes those hospital acquired infections and they're round, they're smaller. And this smaller bacteria with this really tight membrane, they actually just sit on top of the smaller pillar arrays. And as shown previously uh, by some colleagues in the Eisenberg group, when we actually have this larger pillar array, the MRSA just arrange within it in a very ordered fashion. And so this is all to say that, of course, not all bacteria kill, uh, are killed by a pattern or by the same pattern. We really need to engineer the size of our pattern to be appropriate to the bacteria. And so with this, I've introduced that while topography can kill bacteria, it also can be in our second category, which I'm gonna call an anti-fouling surface or one that repels the bacteria. The mechanism by which we think this works is that it decreases the amount of attachment points that the bacteria might have. And so these topographies are also often hydrophobic. Another example of these kind of topography is um, the lotus leaf, which uh, many researchers have replicated the lotus leaf to show that we can make these repellent hydrophobic surfaces that mimic nature. Okay, but let's take a step back. I would say the most common ways that we can make a surface anti-fouling is by using chemistry. And of course, this is an ACS talk, so we would be remiss to not talk a little bit more about chemistry. Um, these are just two, I would say, of the more common approaches that my group has also used. We can use chemistry like polyethylene glycol to do what I might call pegylate a surface or we can attach polymers with our ions to a surface. And in both of these cases, the bacteria are just whipped away. How does this work? Well, how this works is in these cases, we have a very hydrophilic surface. Um, and of course, other hydrophilic polymers have also been shown to be uh, anti-fouling. But in this particular case, case, our hydroxyl groups on the polyethylene glycol actually make a water shell. And the bacteria would have to move into that shell in order to get to the surface or move away that water coating. Same thing with the polymers with our ions. Here in this cartoon, I want you to imagine that our red dot is a cationic charge and our green dot is an anionic charge. So in the case of the polymers with our ions, instead of having this, this hydration cloud made by this hydroxyl bonding, we actually have a very tight cloud of these charge groups. And it's that close proximity of those opposite charges that really make that same sort of hydration layer on the surface of a material. And here's a little bit more about the mechanisms by which these two kind of coatings work. Okay, so all of these hydrophilic polymers are great, but our group, we wanted to know how can we bring these polymers to many different materials applications using a universal way. And what do I mean by that? By that, I mean PEG and polymers with our ions in order to immobilize them on the surface, we might have to do some really fancy chemistry. And that's great, we love fancy chemistry. What we also like, uh, maybe a more simple one pot technique. And so maybe some of you have also been inspired by nature in the way that we have. And here, these are actually these muscles and barnacles 
Um, when we see them on the sides of ship, we say, oh, they're really gonna reduce that fuel usage if that ship tries to move through that ocean way. But as scientists over a decade ago, the Messerschmitt group said, this is amazing. They stick irreversibly even underwater. What a great bio-inspired glue. And so here's one of them that actually um, was grown in the lab. And here, the polydopamine or the dopa gets extruded from the muscle, almost like a polymer extrusion process. And when it mixes in the presence of certain ions and things like this, the proteins are able to attach very irreversibly even to the fluorinated surface of Teflon. And so how does this work? Well, a very simple um, chemical that we can buy from Sigma Aldrich is this DOPA. And when we polymerize it in the presence of oxygen and at a pH of 8.5, it actually makes a self-limiting coating called polydopamine. And again, over a decade ago, it was shown that we could use this polymerization technique on many, many different surfaces. Okay, here's where my lab came in. We thought this is amazing. This is being used on all sorts of materials. We love polymers. Can we actually use this self polymerization of dopamine to carry a polymer along for the ride? So let's say we have dopamine. Can we just throw in there one of our favorite uh, phosphocholine polymers with our ions? Um, one of our collaborators, the Emmerich Group at UMass, makes a lot of different polymers with our ions. So this one happens to be one of our favorites. And if we polymerize the dopamine, will that Zwitter ion stick? We've also looked at, will polyethylene glycols that have a functional handle, will they stick to the coating? And again, we're trying to make this hydration layer that repels bacteria and protein. So in one particular example from our group, we were really interested in those hydrogels used as wound dressings that repel bacteria. So here we took two different gels, polyethylene glycol, an already very fouling resistant material, and we took agar. Agar is literally what we feed our bacteria to keep them alive. So you can imagine that agar gels foul very readily with bacteria. We made these materials into hydrogels, and then during the swelling to give it that um, its final shape, right? It's a hydrogel that loves water. We swell it, and during that swelling, we can diffuse in dopamine, which again, we hoped would carry our polymers with our ion along for the ride. On the right, I show our final gel is brown because we know that that dopamine polymerization has a characteristic brown color. Not to go into the details too much, but we did a lot of rheology to show that when we add our polymers with our ion and polydopamine, it's such a small amount of dopamine, it doesn't even change the mechanical properties of these gels. So we'll find out why later, but we have three different gels that have different stiffnesses and you can see all of our lines overlap. So this means our PEG gels by themselves have the same stiffness as when we have dopamine, as when we have our polymers with our ions. And this is interesting because sometimes when we add a polydopamine or this polymerized thin layer, it can make uh, materials kind of brittle and we didn't want that. Okay, but how does it work? It works fantastically. So what I have shown here up in left, so this is our agar, this is our stiffest agar, but it doesn't really matter. And each of these green dots is a single bacteria. This is a single Staph aureus. So this agar, like I said, very tasty to bacteria. But when we add in our polymers with our ion and dopamine, we can already see we have very few bacteria on top and within our gel. We can quantify this behavior. And here I have how many MRSA, how many Staph aureus attached to the gel after 24 hour after a function of our gels. Agar is green, PEG is blue. And just for sake of example, if we look at our stiff agar as we made it without any polymers with our ion, 
Our as made agar is covered with that bacteria. But if we add in just a little bit of dopamine and really this polymer's water ion that gets glued there, our agar is as fouling resistant as our starting anti fouling peg gel. This is super cool. Okay, so what else have we done with polydopamine glue? So we love our textiles. We had electrospun these cellulose nanofiber mats. And then we showed these kind of as a membrane treatment that we could soak them in a protein disgusting solution for three weeks. And here, the transport through those materials is the best, is the retained when we, they are coated with our uh, polymers with our ion. On this particular plot, we actually want a higher flux recovery ratio, meaning we retain the same property. Okay. We made these cool surfaces where we put down a slippery stripe and a sticky stripe. So here you can guess our slippery stripe is with our polymers with our ion. And our sticky stripe is just a bare silicon substrate. So what is this useful for? Well, sometimes we actually want to consolidate the bacteria into a small spot. So now I can go to these stripes and remove that bacteria and use it in an assay. So here I can consolidate and then culture that bacteria to see what's going on. We've also used the same chemistry trick on membranes in a few different applications. What I'd like to point out was really the really smart that my students did in this case is here, we are treating the membrane with dopamine and polymers with our ion. But like I said, this reaction only happens at a pH of 8.5 in the presence of, of oxygen. So we actually blocked oxygen from getting into the pores of the membrane. This meant that we only coated the surface and not the pores of the membrane. And if you know about water treatment, this is super important because membranes work really well. We just want to keep them working for longer. So here we had the same selectivity, the same ultrafiltration membrane with a higher flux performance and very low fouling. Okay, slightly different application. And in this case, we actually used our dopamine and we wanted to attach cationic charges of a cationic polymer. Um, and here, we, when we altered our nanofiber mats, we were interested in looking how they work at removing uh, particles. So this work was, of course, inspired by the pandemic and the COVID virus to say, how can we improve the function of nanofiber masks? How can we fundamentally understand how integrating in a nanofiber layer would work. Of course, a lot of people work in this area too. And we just thought, you know, we really work a lot with nanofibers. What can we do to help our world? And then finally, we're waiting for the proofs on this paper right now. This is also a little bit different. We actually showed, okay, we don't have to use dopamine and a polymer we can actually work with some very good, again, the Emmerich Group collaborator at making a copolymer where we can balance a sticky and a slippery group on the same backbone. In this case, we showed that we can actually have self-adhesion of these copolymers onto hydroxyapatite, which is a tooth mimic. And then we did a really cool assay, which was like using mouthwash and all the bacteria fell off of our teeth. Okay, so that is quite a bit about these kind of chemistry-based approaches that we can use and we have used. And I seem to have a hole. So just like I showed at the beginning, we can combine release coating and cationic charges. I think making liquid infused surfaces such as the slips uh, pioneered again by the, the Eisenberg group about 2011 or so, this takes the topography and it infuses in a very slippery, usually a fluorinated liquid. And so the pitcher plant, again, uh, biology and nature is a great influence and is so smart. 
our little take on this, please look up the paper because we won't go into details, is again, how can we improve our ultra filtration membrane, which has a very porous topography surface, which we can use to immobilize an oil that is very slippery. So I think I'm still trying to figure out, this is kind of an emerging area where it fits along this, let's say, x-axis of different ways to make an anti-fouling surface. Well, we're not going into details about that because I wanted to at least allude to one other area that our group works in, which is what about mechanics? So in all of these cases, we're saying these are static or universal bulk surfaces. And we thought, what happens if we took that same peg gel and we just made them squishier? And our leading question is, do the mechanical properties of biomaterials influence microbial attachment? And our answer is yes. And so here, just a picture, just a preview. I have in the darker color, a stiffer polyethylene glycol gel. They're fouling resistant, right? But bacteria do still attach. And as you can see visually and in our cartoon, when we have softer hydrogel, softer polyethylene glycol, we actually do have fewer E. coli and staph bacteria attach. So I've kind of put that on here. Is it anti-fouling? Yes, because it uses polyethylene glycol, but it also helps to reduce the initial adhesion of bacteria, which is very interesting and it might give clinicians more time to provide a release coating. Okay, so again, circling back, I showed you how we can connect two different groups. We can make a cationic group. That's also a release coating. Of course, you can make a polyethylene glycol gel that's anti-fouling, also release commercial antibiotics. This is how many commercial catheters currently are. And so this is a nice plot that was recently published by a different group that showed how we can balance the combination approach, right? We want a synergistic approach where if we combine items from two different categories, we're going to have a greater response than either alone. And so here, you know, we can combine microtopography with hydrophilic. They also weren't maybe quite sure where to put lubricant application, but we know it's somewhere between these physical and chemical approaches. And I also wanted to say, I didn't talk at all today about mechanical approaches. So if you have some new ideas, maybe we could talk about that. But again, for ACS, we mainly stuck to chemistry today. And then one more, I guess, teaser is that in addition to killing bacteria, making surfaces that are slippery, we do want to keep bacteria alive. And so I really love this area of living materials. And so we have this nice review paper, this nice new paper where we showed we can actually encapsulate living bacteria into our nanofiber mat. We think of this as edible cotton candy that could really improve the gut microbiome. Not only that, but it has many different environmental and biomedical applications where we do want to keep living bacteria alive longer and promote the healthy bacteria. Okay, so before moving on to talk about the journal, I of course wanted to acknowledge all of the group members that did the work, that do the fantastic science. Uh, we have lots of fun in our science. I think that's very important and I hope you, you do that as well. So I just want to thank them, some of our funding sources. I'll thank ACS Science Talks again in case I forget to do that later. But I wanna talk about this other title that I have listed here, this ACS Applied Engineering Materials. Okay, so what is this new journal? And I hope some of you have tuned in because you're interested in learning more about it. And so I think everyone has heard about ACS Applied Materials and Interfaces, right? This is the journal that launched this entire family in 2009. And I have written the impact factor of the journals that currently have impact factors as well. So in 2009, we had AMI launch. And then, you know, 2018, 
almost nine, nine years later, was the launch of three new journals just because AMI was so successful. And then we had these other, you know, targeted application spaces that weren't being fulfilled. So biomaterials, nanomaterials, energy materials. After that was the launch of electronic materials and polymer materials in 2019. And then I looked it up literally one year ago, exactly one year ago this week, was launched the, the, you could submit a paper to my journal, ACS Applied Engineering Materials. We had an official launch at the fall ACS conference last year. That's what this picture is from. Uh, we are the deputy editors um, of optical materials and engineering materials. And this is in the huge conference center, many stories up in the air. We had this beautiful banner. So we had to you know, take a cheesy photo of it, okay. So how does engineering materials complement this whole material suite? What are we about? Um, before we get into that, of course, you've learned a little bit more about what my lab does. Um, I am the deputy editor of this journal and our lab focuses on polymer materials for human health and the environment. I didn't really talk about our green chemistry today, but we can do that later. Um, our journal and the whole suite of the journal, of course, is under the fantastic advisement of the editor-in-chief, Dr. Kirk Shantz. And then currently we have four associate editors to help us review uh, papers. Um, they have different specialties such as Dr. Berju Gherkin is special, specializes in ionic liquid gas separations. Dr. Svetlana Sukishvili uh, specializes in polymers, coatings, and films. Dr. Yu Wang in composites and Dr. Marcus Worsley in aerogels, porous, and catalytic materials. And of course, we are looking to grow uh, to include some new people from different areas in the world, as I know we have many on the call now that might be interested. Okay, so what are we? We are an international interdisciplinary forum devoted to new research covering all aspects of engineered materials. So we'll get into a little bit more about what that means, but we want new materials designed for timely applications. These can be experimental papers, these can be computational, these could be a combination of experimental and computational papers. Um, and really we are very interdisciplinary. Uh, we integrate knowledge in material science, engineering, physics, mechanics, and chemistry. And here I'm showing, I think we have five issues. A new issue will come out this Friday, the last Friday of every month. And so we already have a suite of beautiful covers. This is a word cloud. This is made with some of the keywords uh, from titles and abstracts of our journal. And, you know, we see words that we would expect, membrane, carbon, composite, polymer, water, some of these keywords are materials, some are applications, supercapacitor, graphene, lots of graphene. Okay, so more uh, specifically, we are open to all kinds of materials. These could be um, reconfigurable materials, biomaterials, carbons and 2D materials, ceramics, foams and emulsions, intermetallics membranes, uh, liquid, porous materials, structural materials, textiles, et cetera. So we love all materials. We also love pretty much all applications and we're open to them, right? So if your application isn't listed, I would love to hear in the chat what other applications we should have listed. And you know, what are we missing, right? We're still new, we're still finding where we need to have more application or more material space. So some applications are 3D printing, adhesion or adhesion prevention that I would also interpret as anti-fouling, anti-corrosion, bioengineering, biotechnology, healthcare, lots in catalysis, um, environmental remediation and protection, friction wear, lubrication, 
um, materials designed for a circular economy, recycling, materials for extreme environments, packaging, scaffolds, separation, structural materials. Okay, so we, we like all applications, we like all materials, but we do have some other rules. <laughs> and so in the first issue of our journal, we had um, this very uh, specific editorial that I invite you to go take a look at. And this describes, I think in the second paragraph, really what we're looking for. So how can we make your submission successful to this journal, right? And so one, we want innovation in materials, chemistry and or design. So I hope that you can see that we need some new chemistry, some new modeling, some new understanding of materials chemistry. Maybe it's a combinatorial, combinational approach, but we should have some new material design. If we're making a new material, we should characterize that material, right? What is its strength? What is its chemistry, et cetera? Very important to this journal, how does that material apply for the intended application? If you're making a membrane, I really hope to see some separation process, right? And then the fourth item, which is also very important is if you're showing me separation of this new zwitterionic membrane, how does it perform compared to other membranes? And so I call this a figure of merit or a means of benchmarking that performance against other established materials and controls from the literature. And so I'm sure you've seen this, it's a chart. It's one of those figures that has a star that says my work is here. You don't necessarily have to have the best performance but maybe you have equal performance to other controls and literature, but your process is greener. Maybe use less solvents. And so these are really what we're looking for and should be stressed in order to have a strong submission to the journal that focuses on materials engineered for a specific application. And as a reminder, we always want to know how your work is unique and new from other work. And with that, I think my last slide is I really just wanted to show you four, I could have showed you many, many more fantastic articles all from India since I'm so happy and thankful today to um, ACS in India for hosting me for this talk. So these are just four different papers all from different universities in India showing the range of applications and materials that we've already had submitted and accepted. These are all in print. Um, I guess they're actually electronic, but you can print them. Uh, we have materials for electronic packaging applications, EMI shielding from hydrogels, alginate, a nice green polymer. Uh, we have this nice uh, computational work on photocatalytic dis uh, disintegration of antacid. Sorry, it's a little behind my camera. And then of course we have this other paper, absorption of toxic metal ions. So water remediation using uh, graphene oxide. And so with that, I will thank you all for listening, for attending, and I'm so happy to take any questions that you have.